Let's see how well you fare. As the Pirate Queen. So it's nice to meet you both. Um, this is not the first time hearing of the game, but I think it's the first time it's coming out to be available for download this week. You've won the awards at Tribeca. I've, I've played a little bit of it downstairs. So my first question really is kind of what the process was like putting this game together. When did Lucy get involved? Was it at the very beginning or not? It's a great question. Um, so we started developing it about, it was 20, end of 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually started developing it as a film to begin with. But when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. we didn't know what the future was going to be. So mm -hmm. we then pivoted and we, I reached out to a friend of mine, a guy called Dr. Dave Ranyard, who used to be the head of PlayStation Studios in London. And I said, Dave, I've been thinking about the Pirate Queen and what if we made it into a game? And he was like, oh, I think that could be a really cool idea. And I was like, you could literally climb up the side of rigging on a pirate ship. You could discover moonlit cabins. You could row across treacherous water. You know, it would be an amazing experience. And so from there, we got some funding from the Cre Creative England in the UK, which is a public body. And we made a short version of the game, which then premiered at Rain Dance Film Festival, and we mm -hmm. won best debut at Rain Dance. And then we showed that to Meta, and they were like, "This is amazing." And we were yeah. like, "Great, thanks so much." <laughs> yeah. And it was kind of one of those bizarre moments where I'd never made a game before, but seemingly everyone was really enjoying it, mm -hmm. and everyone wanted more. So mm -hmm. then we developed the full version of the game, and when we got accepted into Tribeca, we reached out to Lucy's team and. That's when the rest is involved. history, and the rest is history. <laughs> but not forgotten history. Indeed. You know? yes. You're bringing it back. I'm bringing it back to Chengshu, who was forgotten and a historical yeah. figure that um, was never really recognized for being the most powerful pirate. It seems so crazy that in the 19th century, this woman who started as a courtesan would then rise to power and, and have this fleet of pirates that she commanded as well as creating laws for mm. gender equality, mm. men mm -hmm. and women, equal pay, mm -hmm. um, equal status, also creating this treasury system of where the loot would be, and then she would you know, distribute it equally. Yeah. Yeah. And that's basically banking. Mm. So she was really ahead of her time, and she also, it, it's an underdog story. Mm. So when, when Singer Studio reached out to you, you were like, hell yes, I'm in, or was it like you did a little bit of research, you were like, oh, even more. I talked about it. I came in on the easy part, because they had been working on it for so many, five to six years, that once I came on board, we worked together for the voiceover, and it was just a really natural bond that we yeah. had. What led you to discover this character in history? She also appeared recently in a Doctor Who episode. Oh! In fact. But yeah, no, it was a friend of mine who first told me the story, and she literally said, did you know that the most famous pirate in history was a woman? And I was like, that can't be true, can it? And she was like, no, I promise you it is. It was a woman in 19th century China who mm. married the leader of a fleet. And when right. he mysteriously died, she took over and commanded about 70,000 people during the lead up to the Opium Wars and became the most powerful pirate of all time. Yeah. And I was like, this is extraordinary. And then as Lucy says, you know, I looked into it further and the fact that she paved the way for gender equality and she literally created this law that yeah. meant that men and women had to be treated equally mm -hmm. was amazing. It was this idea of this incredible woman being at the forefront of leadership at a time where it was so difficult for women to be seen as equals was... Or to be huge, seen, period. Be seen. Yeah. 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 Was so inspiring and I just figured that if I was a kid growing up and I knew that a woman was the most powerful pirate in history, that would hugely change my perception of gender roles and gender dynamics. Yeah. So yeah, that's how it all began. How much of your experience as a woman in I th what I see as a traditionally male-dominated field, tech, VR, and filmmaking, mm. how much of that added to the experience of creating this game? To do anything, to be honest with you, even just raising finance for a game as a woman yeah. is incredibly challenging. Yeah. Raising finance for a game that has no combat in it right, is right. pretty much impossible. So it, it was huge, and yeah. I think we took a lot of creative risks with the project because we wanted to ensure that it was historically accurate and it was mm. factually accurate and we didn't want to have these combat elements that traditional VR games right. do have um, right. and that was a challenge yeah. but at the same time it was so rewarding to be able to create that game and to win Tribeca and to get this traction with a yeah. project that ultimately hopefully is paving the way for a change in perspective. What I think is wonderful about this is that 
it's a, it's didactic, but mm. it's immersive. So you're doing something and you're learning something without learning. Mm. And I think um, when you ask a question like, what did you use and what did the key look like? I mean, those are things that are based in historic fact mm. and research. And mm. I think it's nice to see and to learn and be part of that as opposed to, let's turn to page 48. <laughs> That's not as exciting as doing something and being actively part of something. Right, right. You know? You'll remember her story more clearly now than reading it from Well, because you are that person. You You're her. living right. that person's life or that moment in yeah. time. And it's sort of like, that's what you're going to remember because it becomes part of your body when you're moving around. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the player has the agency. They're the one that's discovering the story. They're uncovering what's happening and the factions and everything that she has to face the challenges. And mm -hmm. that's... Yeah, that's so exciting. That's why I think VR is such a compelling medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Uh, there's, I mean, a lot of talk about VR's potential as a medium for education, for, you know, empathy as well, and some mm -hmm. people, therapy in that space mm -hmm. as well. I'm curious, both of your perspectives on this. Was it harder to create content for VR, and therefore was it harder also to voice a character in a VR game? So. I guess you guys decide who goes first. I, I, mean, I, I think VR, to me, was something that was new. Mm. And for me, the direction that I received from Eloise, which was such a relief, was to just be very subtle mm. and be quiet. Yeah, you know? you're right in my ear. And I think it's mm -hmm. like you're not, it's sort of like you're talking to yourself. So that's the whole role play, isn't mm. it? One of my biggest peeves with Hollywood and entertainment in general is when Mandarin words or Cantonese words are not pronounced the like original way and kind of bastardized almost and like mm -hmm. hearing that really lent to it for me because I speak both and it's like mm -hmm. I get really annoyed. Um, I don't blame you. It's hard. <laughs> we had a, yeah. a, a coach for the dialect for the mm -hmm. Cantonese because I don't speak Cantonese but it is very specific mm -hmm. and has many more tones than Mandarin mm -hmm. and you know, we wanted to be accurate about it or have somebody dub that in because yes. I was like, I don't want to be bastardizing that. I've done that before where they last minute were like, we're not going to do it in Mandarin, we're going to do it in Cantonese. I was like, wait a minute. I don't speak that language and I can't just, you know, it's like telling me to start speaking German, which would have been easier to do. For you. So we wanted to be very specific about that and yeah. I was like, this is we have to be accurate about it. That yeah. I coached it great because, you, I mean, the pronunciation sounded accurate to me and I was like, oh, Lucy speaks Cantonese too, great. Um. Please, <laughs> thank you. I, I, I'm so embarrassed, but I don't. But, like, the, I will take your compliment My because parents would love it, it's you know? mortifying. Oh, yeah. no, I mean, Ethan, great. And I think that the paying attention to the detail that way is just so helpful to the immersive experience. I think all the more, like you said, the intimacy of the voice in your ear and then having mm -hmm. it all pronounced correctly, at least for someone mm -hmm. like myself who's familiar with the language at least, it, it really transports you. And then the things that you talked about, the different motions of, you know, putting the incense and the incest, mm -hmm. like, pot. This is exactly the sort of game I play. It's the puzzle Aww. game. It's Room Escape. It's, I played those on the browser. Oh, but to have that, the mechanics of the picking up and putting down. Mm -hmm. With your actual, with right, the controller, with the, with the hands yeah. in the game. How does that are, feel? You, you've mapped it so well to the actual mm -hmm. elements that, like, I, in the it's not like over there, but it's right. here. <laughs> Sometimes you pick up a paintbrush and it's just not painting what you're doing yeah. yet. Sometimes it's... So like how much work did you put into that? How important was it for you to get those elements correct as well? Hugely. Yeah. I mean, it was sort of one of the foundations that we started with was to ensure that we were creating something that was as historically and factually accurate as we could possibly yeah. get. And it was so important to us as a UK-based company if we were going to be telling a story of a different culture. Yeah. We needed to be able to get that right. And so we worked with Maya Bodenstein as our writer who specializes in culturally accurate stories. Okay. She's half Chinese and half German. And she's an amazing writer. And we brought on sensitivity checkers and fact checkers. And every iteration of the game was checked and double checked. Mm. The wording, how everything is written, to the fact that when we first designed the game, we built the ship with wooden planks and nails, thinking that any ship would be built with wooden planks right. and nails. And then quickly we realized that we sent it to our researchers to check and they were like, well, actually in China at the time we used dovetail joints. Oh. So then we had to remove every single <laughs> nail from every single ship and wow. replace it with dovetail joints. And it's, it's because if you're going to be creating a story, you have to be doing it properly. And yeah. in VR, it's such a immersive experience that everything needs to feel mm -hmm. like you're stepping back into that place in time. So Engadget's celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. We've been around for a bit. And this might seem like an obvious question, but I want you to think about it. What piece of technology in the last 20 years would you say has either changed your life the most or 
impressed you the most? Because I don't have a lot of gadgets, so mm -hmm. I'm more limited than this young lady here. I just, I think the iPhone has yep. really transformed the way that I live my life. I do try to put it away as much as I can, but I think that it has simplified your life, mm -hmm. is, makes it so much easier to record memories, to record thoughts, to write down things, to communicate. I think back in the day for me, it was like microfiche, you know, let's look at like, <laughs> that's how long ago I was, you know, studying and, and writing papers. Um, and it's just so different, mm -hmm. even a flashlight. Mm -hmm. You know, things that are simple like that. Um, mm -hmm. I find that it's so, I mean, people shoot on on iPhones now yeah. because the mm -hmm. lens is so much better than an actual camera, yeah. you know, and I, that really blew me away. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know, it, it's scary, but it's also wonderful mm -hmm. and convenient. Right. right, how about you? I think mine is probably a computer. Yeah. I can remember getting the first, you know, when we first got a computer and that experience of seeing this giant, <laughs> giant thing yeah. with the keyboard and all of it just being so clunky and huge yeah. in comparison to a tiny laptop that we have now and yeah. how quickly tech develops and changes yeah. is so phenomenal to the point that the Apple Vision Pro, which technically, you know, is a computer, right. is literally just sitting on your head and that's remarkable. I was very lucky that Apple brought me in to see the Apple Vision Pro last year before, way before nice. it was released yeah. and being yeah. able to see the tech for the first time and to put it on in the Apple HQ, in Apple HQ and yeah. experience this and the eye tracking and the hand tracking and just the UI and how the whole thing is set up is unbelievable yeah. and I literally took it off and spoke to the devs and I was like I've never experienced anything like wow. this. You guys are changing you literally are changing the world with this technology. I also yeah. think um, drones are pretty significant in yeah. filmmaking, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, as well as you know tracking people or criminals or yep. you know it can be used for good and for bad. But the fact that it's something that is lightweight and mm. can record or can, I mean, I don't know that this is not something that I would have thought could have been possible this quickly. I know. Yeah. Things move really quickly. So speaking of the Vision Pro, actually, mm -hmm. I know that the game's now available in you know Meta's store and that sort of stuff. Any plans for broadening that in terms of not just the franchise that I think is in the works, but also other platforms as well? Our intention is 100% to release it on as many headsets as we possibly can. Gotcha. Um, obviously, Meta funded the game, right. and so releasing it on Meta is the most important thing. And yeah. I'm so grateful to Meta that they are the ones who allowed us to create this. but. 100% will be releasing it on other headsets. I think that was it. Thank you very much Thank for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so Great much. Great questions. Yeah.